Welcome to Uncorked and Uncut Email Marketing Friends at Home, a vodcast with a new guest each episode, and your hosts, Kath Pei and Ryan Phelan. Hello, friends. Welcome to uh, season two of Uncorked and Uncut. Uh, we're, we're joined today. Uh, I feel like I'm at a wedding. We are gathered here today. <laughs> Uh, we're joined today by uh, both Kath and I's great friend, uh, Tink Taylor, uh, and, and I don't know that he needs much of an introduction, but we'll let him tell his story here in a little bit. Uh, but Kath, how in the hell are you doing? I'm good. I'm really, really good. And yeah. Tink, you are, you are well, uh, we're going to start with, what is everybody drinking? I actually get to drink in this one because it's like <laughs> past noon. And, and I'm I'm actually drinking like I, I'm drinking this. See, I'm jealous you have oh, that. I looked it's like eight that. p.m. at night, so it's kind of like it feels like it's whiskey time for me. Yes. You know? I, whiskey too early. I am uh, drinking Monkey Shoulder Blended mm -hmm. Scotch, which, if you have not tried it, it is a must buy, even for a blend. It is probably the best blend I've found. And uh, Tink, what are you? What are you? What are you partaking of? Yes. <laughs> you guys know I've lined up a few, and I'm going to let you decide. And actually, I've got one other option. Now you've shown me what you're drinking. So All right. I, I actually have poured myself here a. This is a non-alcoholic gin and tonic. What, so, why, why? Why would we do that? Why would we? I know. Oh, we were talking. We were talking offline. I I I, I sort of do some work. Uh, you know, so, companies that I've invested in and one of them is this this brand here which is Liars I could show you that there's yeah. like an alcoholic spirits um nice right, Liars by the way it's an Australian brand by birth so uh, from uh, Cass I didn't realize uh, it was Australian uh, and it's it's named after the liar bird that you get in Australia right. that, that mimics right. the sound of any song so they they have what a great name for it of types course of spirits and they mimic exactly yeah. the time to exactly mimic the flavors uh, so you can make the cocktails, but in a, in a low calorie and non alcoholic Oh, somebody's a marketing genius at that company. I don't know who it is. Excellent. They, they might have had some help. Uh, <laughs> they might have had some help. Nice. So I have another option here. So I, I don't say I don't do everything non-alcoholic. I've also uh, invested in a brewery. So this is one of their new beers, just fresh off the production line. They just started doing cans. So this is the cure for the common Kolsch. Uh, so we've got that. And then I've got my go-to, which is a Canadian. It's a nude. Can you see nude? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just exactly. vodka great. soda, uh, low calorie. And then my, I've got this sitting here, which I wasn't going to drink. Since you're drinking whiskey, I've got a friend's birthday tonight. And I was oh. going to And this is lovely. This is one that of my, is one of my favorite <laughs> scotches, the double wood. Is that the cherry? Uh, the cherry or the, um, which cask is that? This is, that's a... That's a double wood. I've got a single cast sitting in the, in right. the cup there as well. But yeah, now you've shown me your, 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 your whiskeys. You've, you've seriously tempted. But that's a birthday present. That's got to stay there. That's, yes. I wouldn't want to open that, but I might. <laughs> well, very but nice. You, wait, wait, wait. Your, your, your birthday has been, been and gone. I mean, oh, it's not my birthday. So that's, a, that's a present for a friend's birthday. Having a bit of a surprise gathering from him. Uh, oh, gotcha. Well, but he knows you. He knows that if it's open, that's like normal. I could, t I could top it up with some non alcoholic, perhaps, and you will never notice. Yeah. <laughs> never, never. It must be very unique. A unique but we're thing. off air, right? He's, he'll never know. Right, right. No one's ever going to see this. No. <laughs> this goes nowhere at all. At all. I, I think I'm, I might just crack open my nude, you know. It's uh, very refreshing. It's okay. all the age up here in Canada, these sort of uh, pre mixed. Because uh, uh, and sodas, I think they do tequilas and stuff like that now. This is a family-friendly show. We don't do nudes. <laughs> but they do neutral. I should have bought a neutral, shouldn't I? That's a different brand. But, uh, these are my favorite. But this is this is mixed with wine. There we go. So yes, I think we, we we were talking we were talking about birthdays, right? And I have experienced a few of your birthdays. In I've life. heard about them. They're legendary. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, actually came up, up on Facebook. Was it yesterday? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. About it and everything. So tell us, tell us the whole connection between your birthday and how it became a tradition over years and obscurely Morris dancing. And you may need to, for the international audience, 
actually explain what Morris dancing is. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where my mind went immediately. People are going to understand that. So, uh, yeah, Morris dancing is a, a traditional dance in the UK. We don't have many traditions that, uh, you know, as, as such that are ancient. It's, it's, it's men dress up in very sort of feminine clothing with bells and stuff on, and they sort of skip around. I think the origins is it's a fertility dance. Uh, they dance around something called a maypole. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the type of thing that you would only expect to see in a very uh, small uh, village town. You yeah. would never see it in London. Yeah. The story that, that Cass alluding to is like many years ago, I had a, a birthday and I said to a few of the guys in the office, like, let's go out for some drinks. And it was Tuesday and no one could come. Everyone was going to go out on Friday. So yeah, a handful of us went out and some Morris dancers, these strange gentlemen, happened to be in our pub in the middle of London. And uh, yeah, we had a few drinks ensued and we, we ended up uh, getting them to teach us how to Morris dance. So that was extremely good fun. And we all went back to the office the next day and went, oh, those of you who didn't come, you missed out on such a random night. And then the following year, you know, that was our local pub uh, by you know, Dot, Dot Mailer, as it was then, HQ. And uh, the landlord sort of said, the Morris dancers that were here have asked if you're coming back for your, for your birthday this year because they had such a great time last year. So we oh said, well, everyone who missed out then came. And I think it went for like 10 years. It just got yeah. bigger and bigger and bigger. And if, 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 you, if your mind goes back to the year of the, all the riots that were in London, and yeah, we used to go outside. Just so many people, I don't know, 500 people used to turn up and we'd be dancing. Yeah. Other, other groups of Morris dancers have somehow found out about this. So they, they used to come. So there was, there was hundreds of these Morris dancers and people. Well, the police turned up because they, they, they'd heard about this disturbance in the street. <laughs> and, uh, they found us all doing this sort of very, very, very elaborate dance that's, that's quite effeminate. Uh, uh, <laughs> and the policeman, I asked the policeman, it's like, yeah, what? what a policeman at the moment he said well judging on tonight it's very varied and they they came along and they, they locked off the street for us so we could carry on doing our dance and this happened for many years I, I even when I moved overseas I used to fly back especially for it because everyone demanded it and eventually sadly the pub was sold so that put an end to it so I oh my gosh I have a different tradition now I have a party here and, uh, where I'm living in Canada and a, a load of people come up and I get live we we'll never never replace the Morris dancing uh, but every now and again, a, a, a video springs up of that stuff, and you know, Caps right, one popped up on Facebook yes, yesterday. And it's it's just simply bizarre. It's hard to explain. I'm sure everyone's sitting in North America right now, going, "What on earth are these guys talking about?" Well, no, because I saw your name attached to it, and I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> this is just normal." It's, it's so strange, and how it escalated, I have no idea. But it was a huge amount of fun. And I think that video popped up after another video that he shared as well of the dot mailer, as it was then, team, or dancing backwards. I, I, I can't remember what that was for. Everyone was doing, uh, <laughs> trying to do the Michael Jackson moonwalk for some reason. Superman. Oh, I can't remember. What exactly. So there's Superman there. There was Gav who was being a, he wasn't being a stormtrooper. What was the, the who it was were in they? He was a super, the stormtrooper. Uh, who, who were they before the stormtroopers? The original stormtroopers, but they're not stormtroopers. There's oh, something I like a storm trooper, but Anyhow, I so he had the, he had the the, the you know the, the helmet on, and he writes on, writes on your post and he says, "We look so young then." It's like you've got a helmet on; we can't even see you. <laughs> Gav's not changed in, in decades. He hasn't. He hasn't I, I mercilessly tease him every time I see him, just saying he's got a bald spot, but uh, it's all lies. It's just because he's <laughs> looking and got such a great personality. You've got to knock him down for something. <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness. Tink, for, for those of you, or for those of the people watching this that have been living under a box for the last 20 years, uh, give us a brief overview of what you do and what you founded and, and how you've uh, come to be um, such an amazing influence in this industry. Oh, that's kind of you to say. Uh, yeah, brief synopsis. You know, founded Dot Digital, best part of, uh, was, I think it's 21 years this year. Um, so yeah, we're, we're now adults, I suppose, but yeah, founded, you know, the business that, you know, latterly has become Doc Digital. We've changed our names a few times. You know, we started off as a, 
a, a web design development company, uh, sort of back end of the dot com bubble bursting. But we were really technologists uh, at that stage. So we we were building software. So we um, yeah we built a content management system. We built uh, an e commerce platform. Dot editor, dot commerce, funny enough, and then dot mailer. You know, it was a, an actual addition into that to uh, you know market the websites that, that we had built. Uh, and, you know, we faced some cha challenges along the way. We had three amazing products. I mean, if I look at uh, something like dot commerce now, I work very closely in that in the e-commerce community, and I, I see some of the features that are like to Shopify, Big Commerce. Magento, you know, bringing out and big announcements, and I'm thinking, Christ, we had, yeah, you know, we we had some of that stuff you know, yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. yeah. But we couldn't compete on on a marketing front across three strands, so we had to, you know, uh, focus on something. And you know, we did some strategy session, sessions at our end about um, what should we focus on. You know, email gave us instant MRR, and it was, you know, it's a very good predictive model on forecasting revenue and you know, I was fortunate enough to sort of say well I'll, I'll take that but I'll give it a bit of a try and uh, see if we can you know make a bit of a go for that to changing out of what was the core business back then and you know the rest is history you know it's it, it's, it's quite easy to model uh, if you've got a, a good product and a good team behind you that can yeah. support that and sell it. Well, dot digital, dot mailer, all of the, you know, all those names have been kind of a staple in this industry forever, right? And what if, since the, nowadays, the, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I obviously spend a lot of my time overseas. We're the biggest of what we do in in the UK, and that's great. And we've got a great team there. And I, I kind of like the, uh, you know, I could swank around in the UK, but I quite like the uh, the entrepreneurial side as well. And there's still parts of the world you go and they've not heard of us. So you know, yeah. And, you know, sort of helping the team extend our tentacles further into into Asia and uh, South America, sort of all the conversations at the moment, and we're sort of heading to meet Asia through through Europe as well. So you know, it's exciting, yeah. exciting, exciting times. And I think you know, when I sat down with my uh, original co-founders, one of our mission statements back then, over a pint in the pub, was you know we want to build a product that is is known and used around the world. And you know we're, we're pretty pretty much near as damn it, uh, achieve that. So it's, it's, it's it's exhilarating. It's really, you know, really quite fulfilling to see. Isn't there a plaque in a pub somewhere that says this? <laughs> well, uh, Kath might have seen it. Um, we opened an, our head office in London Bridge. I can't remember. We moved office. It's probably coming up to ten years ago. We moved into that building, and uh, yeah, it was me? cool like, HQ. And as a surprise, they uh, the actual idea for Dot Mailer. Uh, was come up by one of our sales guys, a guy called Roger Kentish, to make sure I give him a name check. But he kind of, in a very non-technical way, described putting an invisible GIF in an email. Just looked around the table and the penny dropped and went, wow, we should build that. And we did the next day. So that was in a pub called The Treehouse that we used to go off on. It was opposite our office then. Uh, Kaff may have been to The Treehouse, actually. Um, but when we opened up the head office, the sort of the lunch area, uh, yeah. the team that put the office together built a replica of the treehouse pub yeah. uh, for everyone to have lunch and they actually went back to that pub and they got the very tables that we used to to eat and drink at and the table that we came up with the idea it's probably still got my chewing gum stuck underneath it and what have you but yeah <laughs> super nice touch we actually call that the tea house and that's where uh, all the guys go so we have a plaque on that uh, replica of the pub you know uh, like the plaques you get in the UK that says, I know, you know, so Arthur Conan Doyle lived here when he wrote Sherlock Holmes. Right. Or, so it's like yeah. the founders yeah. were here. Uh, but yeah, no, it's super nice touch. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice talking point when someone comes into that office. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was a judge just last week on, um, at the Dotties, right? Mm. So, and um, I was quite happy to see there, there's a lot of, um, I mean, the three biggest, um, uh, I guess, uh, country that you're, you know, you're most prominent is obviously UK, US and Australia. And so yeah. you, you had, you had a good amount of, you know, entries from those countries. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't see, you know, others, but still, I think for, for, you know, um, I think you, you've, you've done well to go international like that. And um, I mean, Rowan must be doing um, really well in Australia. 
Yeah, I mean, it's quite serendipitous, serendipitous Ryan. Yeah, Ryan was sort of my, what a better word, number two in, in London for a long time. Ran the sales team there. Uh, you know, that includes sort of our customer services and also some of our professional services, actually. And, uh, yeah, he, he got to a point in his life, he'd been with us at that stage, maybe 10 years, uh, knew the business really well, but it's, he was Australian by birth. I think his kids were coming up uh, to sort of school age. And, you know, me and him had a chat and it was like, well, maybe he would come and help uh, scale our uh, US-based team or maybe, you know, we, we would already started in Australia. They'd seen quite a bit of traction down there and it's like, well, maybe make the, the jump directly to Australia. So, you know, there were a few bumps and kinks in the road, but he kind of got there and he's out there doing what he does best. You know, he really builds a really good team. Uh, yeah. People love working with him. He knows his stuff. He knows us, you know, just uh, someone that... Uh, understands how the internal workings uh, go yeah. the organization has its own sort of processes and methodologies so yeah it's good and you know i spend a lot i still spend a lot of time talking to him um chat to him last night actually you know time zone where i live now is very friendly for all the international offices for, for obvious reasons but uh yeah it, it's uh depends on what time of day we catch up that I get a different row or he gets a different tink. You know, maybe I've had an apres ski and he's had an early start on the bike ride or the other way around, you know. <laughs> wow. Well, you've got a bit of history with Australia though, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, I've been, been to Australia a ton of times, you know, just on, on business uh, alone in, in the recent years. I was probably going at least four times a year. Um, they do a lot of thought leadership out there. Um, very well known in sort of the e-commerce world. It's quite, it's quite a small ecosystem there. But outside of that, you know, I, you know I, I came from a background of windsurfing. So a lot of my, my, my friends that I used to work at a windsurf uh, school live and work out there now. Uh, I've got a ton of mates from university that bizarrely live over there. Really want a really funny story about understanding wording internationalization. I'll tell you that in a minute. But, uh, and, you know, I, I dated a girl many years ago. I think you you met a cat actually uh, she, she was there from from, from, the, from from that era which is feels like a lifetime ago uh, I've still got a lot of friends from that so I think when I get to Australia I sort of check in at, at the airport and just my inbox floods of like oh we've got to catch up it's yes. uh, it's really quite lovely it's uh, it's one of my favorite places in the world yeah well I mean you going back to the windsurfing didn't you go didn't you teach in like Egypt or some some place like that where, where were you teaching uh, I actually taught in a place called Club Basiliki in Greece. Right. Um, the, it's the largest windsurf school in the world. It's super impressive. Um, I think I can't remember now. They had some like 500 brand new boards and sails every year, top equipment. Uh, it was all rigged up, ready to go. You know, 30, 40 instructors. It was a you know, specialist hotel for it. The conditions were perfect for beginners in the, in the morning. It was like glass and then come three o'clock you can barely stand up because it was windy as old boots and people were doing you know somersaults and stuff like that yeah, it's a, yeah, a, yeah. a beautiful idyllic place and that, that's where kind of my journey began I was a techie by trade and every now and again the wind didn't blow so I built the sort of online booking system for those guys and websites I was bored uh, it was obviously it was a very expensive holiday so it's kind of sea level so a lot of the people I was teaching you know I you know it got to know over a number of years. They saw that and they said, when you get back to uh, UK, can you build our website? And it's like, sure. You know, who do you work for? It's like the BBC. It's like, crikey, I'm going to need help. And that's where I kind of put the guy together that you would know was the original co-founding. But I had a big book of business to bring with me from, from people, people I knew. And, you know, outside, you know, we built, for example, a lot of websites for the BBC brands like Top Gear, you know, Radio Times top of the pops back in the day and they needed marketing and that was the kind of where they came to us and said our email tools rubbish can you build us one and that's that's kind of where everything started so it all kind of for me started uh, back in Greece and windsurfing right? wow I never knew that story that's, that's fun. Very, very cool but but for you you know like... actually on that note when uh, we'd, we'd started and uh, uh, Tony who runs uh, Club Vasiliki he had an interesting way of saying you did a good job. You know, he, you know it was always it, the, the dialogue with everyone going, will you come back next year? It was, it was almost like, you know, if I pass you the salt and pepper, you'll get an extra 5,000 drachmas if you come back. And I remember having a chat with him and I said, Look, I've just started this internet thingy. Uh, you know, if it, if it goes tits up, can I come out mid-season? Uh, but I feel like I need to give it a go. And 
you know, it was him giving me the okay to do that that really allowed, allowed me to put the time and effort to give it a good go and really get it going. And I, you know, I'll be forever grateful to him for that because, uh, you know, still a lot of business decisions along the way where, you know, you've got to take risks as you grow a business. And for me, you know, if it goes really well, I'll go back to that place because it's paradise. Uh, I'll, I'll go back in a slightly bigger house, but if it goes really badly wrong, I'll go back to paradise and do what I love and enjoy in, in a great place. Yeah. So, the, the degree of risk in making decisions uh, for me personally was sort of, you know, tempered by, you know, it's, it's a great result either way. Let's go for it. All that. Yeah. But for, for you, I mean, it's, it, ever since I've known you, when we first met in like 2004, so we've known each other a while. Um, ever since I've known you, you have, you appear to have mastered the work life balance. You know, take, 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 take for where you, you live at the moment, right? Like you said, you know, one day you may be out, you know, skiing and the next one you're, you're trekking the next month. You, you know what I mean? Like you, you can do so much and that's by choice. It's not, you didn't just happen to be there. You've gone there and said, this is the lifestyle I want. I like to travel and I like to do all these sports and this is what I'm going to do. So... Mm -hmm. Tell us more about Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's taken me a long time to get there. I, I, I think we've had this conversation when we first met. Uh, and for many years after that, the work-life balance was completely tipped in the other, other direction. So, um, yeah, I, 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 as you described, I, I live in a good place now where I'm spoilt for choice of the things that I can, I can do. I obviously enjoy the outdoors, the whole windsurfing and extreme sports things, my bag. Um, and I, I'm living in a place I could do that. And I've only been able to get there by, you know, a lot of hard work. But the biggest bit of hard work there was, you know, bringing, we mentioned Rowan's, bringing people in. Uh, you know, Milan, our, our now CEO, uh, he, you know, we've, he's grown from within. He's been with us for a long time. Um, and they're, they're supportive of that, saying that, I, you know, it, it's actually quite nice that I'm, I'm sort of this end of the world. So I don't tread on their toes, but still there to help them, uh, a supporting uh, side of things, uh, mentoring if need be, you know, obviously work with the leadership team all the time on strategy and direction. So yeah, uh, I've, I've handed over the, the day to day nitty gritty and work on some really fun projects. And you know, that, that project for me is still the global expansion and you know, dominance of, of, of dot digital around the world. You know, that, that's still, still drives us on. And it's fun actually the travel going from the, the, you know, I think we've got 14 offices around the world now. And going from one region to the other to a different region about how big and well known we are from one place to the next. That variation is, yeah, you know, yeah, it's is phenomenal, uh, and that changes, yeah, you know, day by day, month by month. Yeah. I, I, one thing I've noticed is is a lot of the, the early thought leaders, right? The three of us and and the rest of the gang out there. What I've seen is over the years we put in a lot of time, we put in a lot of hours, and and slogged away and and I look at a lot of people now and the the careers they have or the choices they made are to choose a work life balance because they've gotten there they've they've done their bit for God and country and 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 now what's most important is doing things that they really enjoy I mean I think about myself right I I slogged away and, and left my last company two years ago and I thought well you know what I've always wanted to do this and I might as well jump off the Thing. And I did the same thing as you. I kind of, I, I kind of looked at my finances and I said, okay, I got 12 months to see if I can make this work. And if, and, and if it doesn't, then I got this option and I can go do that. Yeah. And, but the choice for me was, I want to have a better life. I want to have, I want to relax a little bit more and, and, uh, and, and I'm willing to have trade-offs for that. And uh, so I see it as a consistent theme that people, you know, at, at our place in this industry have just gotten to that point where it's like, I need some time because I spent, you know, 150,000 miles on the year, uh, you know, in the air every year for 15 years. Yeah. But, and if, think, if, I mean, for me what, personally, I was doing 100, 150 flights a year. Uh, yeah. And where I live, it's two hours to the airport and back. So, you know, that's just, you know, 500 odd hours of my life back without the, the yeah. other stuff. You can't, you know, go the pandemic situation. But I think, as you described there, I think everyone's world's been, you know, turned upside down with the, the, the pandemic that, that we're living in. 
you know, people working from home, not commuting, you know, where they choose to live. You know, I've got a ton of uh, friends from my time where I lived in New York have elected to move out. You know, why am I paying so much rent when, you know, I'm here for New York because of New York and it's just not the same anymore. So they moved out to Long Beach or someone moved over to California because their company are allowing them to work from home. So I think lots of people will be asking yeah. themselves the questions that you, you did uh, you know, in the, your fairly recent history, but after you know, a decade or so of going yeah. for the draft, I think some people won't have to you know, you know, put that time in to, to make that work-life balance decision. I think, it's yeah. gonna be, I think it's gonna be better for a lot of people as well. I think it's probably- Oh yeah. I mean, I got two years ago, I sat uh, down at one point, I, I figured it up and, and for the better part of 10 years, I spent 50% of my evenings in a bed that other people had slept in. Right. And it was like, this is- I heard that about you. Huh? Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tink, I've heard some tales. <laughs> There's, we all have stories. Um, <laughs> how did you two meet? I heard there was a story that was quite interesting. Is well, there? I don't know that it's interesting. I, but, I'm, I'm going to wonder what Cat's going to say here. Tink, no, Tink just say what it. she thinks I'm going to say. But, Tink but. loves to tell it. It's like every time I'm with him, Tink just goes, okay, so, and then he goes, <laughs> although you usually have a few drinks in you by the time you, you, you actually come around to doing it. But no, you do like to are, tell Are we it. talking about your first... Um, mm -hmm. uh, Meeting at the yeah. DMA, yeah. Oh, bless Kath. I mean, it, it, it actually fills me full of pride looking at uh, where Kath stands in this world today. But back, back in the day, when I first joined the DMA email council, hundreds of years ago now, yeah, it was quite intimidating. There was a lot of really big, strong characters in, in the UK, which glo you know, they were huge global thought leaders at that time and we, we had lots of conversations about you know, the thought leadership in this this industry is pretty much being driven by these characters in, in the uk so it was intimidating mm -hmm. and to join your first the first thing you do when you join is uh you go as an observer so you don't say anything but you get asked sort of any other business at the end and as i was listening there was loads of things that were being said and i was like oh we should probably ask this and then there'll be a huge heated debate, you know, someone like Della would dive in and be very opinionated on one subject, unsurprisingly. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, and, you know, Simone Barrett for me, Dialogue was there and she, she you know, Simone and uh, uh, Della would have a tussle and what have you. And it was like, but it, literally everything I thought of um, it had been dived into and someone had sort of been jumped at and I was like, oh, God, glad I didn't mention that. So I, I felt, yeah, and it came out to me the any other business. I sort of said, "Oh, nothing. It's nice to meet you all. We'll go and have a beer and have a chat afterwards." Uh, so we we set up the the, the the DMA email beer club that we we had for years off the back of that. But uh, and then the calf joined uh, a year or two later. Uh, so I, I encouraged her to join. I think to come as an observer. And <laughs> this is a bit the calf knows I I'll tell. It is a scary. You forget how intimidating that situation was and. Literally, the first thing Kaf said, she just bottom lip, just wob physically wobbled with intimidation. <laughs> like the most timid, most I, a shy person ever. I can't remember the question, but it was literally like, Wee -wee -wee. <laughs> and I, 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 every time I see Kaf, I tease her mercilessly about that. But it goes to show, I mean, her standing now yeah. in this world is just so chalk and cheese from that moment. And there's a serious amount of hard hard work and effort and graft and you know it, it fills me with inspiration when i see someone like calf step up and do that in in this kind of industry and i think yeah we, we, we've talked a lot recently about diversity in this industry and i think i think there's pretty much no one from our era for sure that you know when at school said i'm going to be an email marketing you know we all kind of fell into it somehow yeah. um, you know with tech or marketing or yeah. whatever it be. Um, but I think that's given us all a, a really good opportunity to grow and scale as individuals and as opportunities have come up. And I think we're, you know, the conversations I'm very much part of is, you know, how do we encourage more people at school from all diversities to say, this is a phenomenal industry to be in. And, you know, uh, you know have, have people like ourselves, we put our ourselves in our shoes 20 years ago, going, there's a career for me here. I want to pursue yeah. it. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, and that's what I was going to say about, that, you know... Did I get that story, by the way, Kath? Sorry? Did I get that story right? You're, you're uh, <laughs> that was the one I said to Ryan. I said, <laughs> you'll probably say that because he always tells that one. Um, it, it's, it's interesting, though, for all of us. Uh, I mean, like, Ryan, you're, you're a massive character, and, you know, you, 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 you know, Len and Dennis, I've hung out with countless times, all big characters, but I think it's really good to remember. Like, we, you know, Kath, you're now one of the big characters, so when someone else steps up yeah. in that situation... Uh, is you know, is being open and welcoming uh, uh, into that group and having people be able to put ideas in and what have you. And that really is what our industry was about. I mean, around that table, I mean, you were selling, you know, you had an ESP back in those days. Everyone was friends and our mission was to grow yeah. the industry. Okay, day by day, we were probably in the occasional pitch together. That's fine. Let, we, yeah. you know, there was a real camaraderie about how uh, yeah. it's on to the next level. And I think yeah. the last time I... Probably physically saw you both in the same place. I I'd, I'd gone to an EEC conference, and it was uh, it's the first time I my international travel. I'd been able to go for a while, and what I found quite interesting there, you know, I was you know, delightful to catch up with with everyone. And you know, Della was telling us about how his daughter was talking about email marketing. I know about Kath and her kids were talking about email marketing. You got Lauren was talking about his daughter yeah. in the UK doing it. And I was like, why is that generation not here? Actually, perhaps they should be here instead of us, you know? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, I found that quite, it, it was a different set of energy from the first time I went. It's like, I'm bringing the kids as well. Let's give this a boost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, Jonathan's been to, um, I mean, he goes to all the ones here in, in London, but he, uh, I took him to the Vegas one, uh, Email Innovations. And yeah, he's got, he's got his own crowd. He's got his own, yeah. you know. It's, it's, I it's, love seeing that. It's exactly amazing. it's kind of like it's a, it's a different vibe it's a different different i mean i know them all but i'm not overly you know yeah. best friends with them so yeah it's really really good he's it's, he's, he's made I, his own fantastic. way i noticed that in the same year so uh, when i went to the oi one at vegas last year you had all of the old timers kind of sitting together yeah and then you had all of the next generation clicking together and it was just, it was fun to watch them because it was like, that was us 20 years ago kind of thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. that was us palling around and sharing stuff and joking and going out and drinking and whatever. And uh, it was, it was neat to see. I mean, shoot, you talk about being intimidated and stuff. I can remember when I first came into this industry, I had done some press and, and started to put my name out there and started to just talk very humbly, right? Because you had like Lauren and you had Kath and you had all these different people, right? And Lauren, right, for me was just like, oh my goodness. talk to the man. And, and Stefan Pollard. Stefan. Oh, Stefan. Oh my you know, goodness. I mean, in the nicest man in the world, but scared the crap out of me because it was like, he is really smart. And uh, yeah. I can remember being at a Sherpa conference and uh I was there and Lauren walks up to me and he says, Hey, how you doing? Man, your star is rising faster than mine did. What the hell are you doing? And I just knew at that, at that, and I can remember it, the whole thing vividly. I can remember it as, as knowing that I had arrived in the industry and knowing that I had been accepted to, to, to talk. And, and it was one of those powerful moments. I don't even think I've ever told him that story. Uh, it's, ama it's amazing you know, all these characters you know I, I, I'm I mean I know you, you I, I'm putting words into your mouth but I think we're all also fortunate to call each other really good friends yeah, yeah. Uh, it's brilliant and I, I'm embarrassed Kath with a bottom lip so I, I feel a bit bad about that but I had that a similar moment I did my first public speech or my big public speech was a DMA event and we'd flown Stephanie Miller over from, from the US when she was at I Mita organized that event and it was at London Zoo. I mean, it was such yeah, a... Yeah, I organised that one. Yeah. <laughs> was, I think we are in the monkey enclosure in London, London Zoo, giving yes. a yes. speech. My, my lip wasn't wobbling, but my knees was, were definitely wobbling. And I was like, I'm with this uh, yeah. personality, yeah. big name, Stephanie Miller, and she couldn't be a nicer human being either, and she's become... Oh, a absolutely. Player. Yeah. Funniest story, oh. I, was, um, I was at EIS one year, and my, my process before I get on stage is that I kind of go off on the side and and say a prayer and kind of get my mind centered around what I'm going to say. And so I'm at EIS and Joel Book walks up to me. Another one that I'm just like, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, you know. And he's like, hey, how's, how's it going, man? And uh, I said, Joel, 
I don't know why, but this audience scares the crap out of me. Every, I am never nervous anywhere. I said, but if I present here, I am nervous to get up on stage. I don't care how good it is. And he's like, so am I. Because the people in this audience can call your shit and tell you you're wrong. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm dying. Oh, I think, I think one of the easiest caveats in our, in our industry, if someone ever does throw something out there, is you know, right. that's, a, that's a great idea. Let's test it. Or if you can test it and just let me know what, what your findings are, then hey, hey you, know, so you, can never, yeah, you can't, can't be completely called out, I don't think. Yep. Yeah, for sure. What have you, uh, Tim, what have you seen change? You were, you we all have been here for the, the entirety of this history. Um, what's the, as a CEO of a company that's, that's one of the big leaders in this space, what have you seen change, uh, not only in, in, in the email space, but just society and its acceptance of email? Well, I should first point out Milan's CEO now. So he's doing all the whole growth. Well, yes. Sorry. We're a public company and he, he gets fleeced uh, mercilessly to go and do all the investor relationships and the good luck to him with that. And it actually does a tremendous job. But, uh, yeah. yeah, in terms of you know, be, being a leader in the business and you know, in, in the industry, I mean, it's, it's, it's changed a lot. I, I was having a conversation only in the last couple of days as, a, as an extraordinary tech scene where I live. Um, and I, I caught up with this guy, he's... he's, he's serial entrepreneur and sold a lot of businesses and we had dinner the other night and um, we were talking about you know our, our, our initial growth and you know dot mailer back in the day you know, one of our brand marks was a was a plane and our logo very similar to the raf actually they might have mentioned that in a, a letter or two from their lawyers uh, and they, uh one of our first marketing campaigns we'd never done a trade show um we had a really simple thing we had a big but it was almost like a coffin. We called it our inbox and we had like obstacles in front of a little hole. We called them spam filters. And we got people to uh, print it out a sheet of A4 that had folding instructions to make a paper airplane with our logo on it. Obviously you have a tick box to, to fill in your email address and all of that sort of stuff. And we said, how hard is it to hit your target with paper? And we had people at this uh, trade show throwing paper airplanes I mean, flying all over the place. And it just didn't, demonstrated the point that you know digital was better than paper at, at hitting the, hitting your target market it couldn't have been a better sort of physical analogy but i mean can you imagine trying to do that now it would seem so old-fashioned like yeah. that message and the the levels of complexity and uh, you know, that you should be deploying your data at and you know, we've got so much data now we're talking about using machine learning and ai to sort of drive your segmentation and all of that sort of stuff and we're not you know, in, our, in, in my world, certainly now, you know, I don't see as much as you guys as I used to because you know, we talk a lot more omni-channel and we're quite niche in you know, sort of the CRM space and the e-commerce space. Um, but that, for me, has changed quite significantly, you know, you know, the sophistication. And also the kind of, you know, we, we grew up, we were quite a simple product, but you know, we've been making updates every two weeks for the last 20 years. We do a lot more than we used to. When we used to look up the chain of you know, ESPs and competitors, they had all sorts of bells and whistles that we didn't, but we, we do now, but we deploy them in maybe a different way for a size of target market. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's sort of bringing those level of technicalities and you know, sophistication of what you can do to that sort of mid-tier market, which is our sweet spot, is what wasn't achievable before, and you wouldn't even dream of it uh, back in the day. And it's still quite, when you say what's changed, one bit that hasn't changed, it, it, I still find it staggering, that just the, the education piece when you sit in a room, we've all spoke and we try and talk, you know, highfalutin and this complicated stuff. And then you've got any questions and people just still ask, you know, yeah. sort of the email 101 questions because they're yeah. not. So, yeah, we should never forget the, 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 the hardcore basics uh, whilst also trying to get more sophisticated yeah. and like, you know, better, you know, yeah. feedback or whatever it might be because that delivers you better results but it's, it's, it's maybe it's just more people coming into the industry um but it's staggering but yeah the, the value of email when we first started explaining i think we used to charge 10p an email when we first started i and know that used to come yeah there was no future in it we would never make any money out of that i remember hearing that comment uh, i won't mention it, he said that to me uh but the 
we used to have to talk to that, that came out of the IT budget and now obviously there's marketing budgets. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. talk to people in the US and their business title is e not e commerce, email marketing director, and they've got a whole team. Yes. You know, so all of that stuff's staying. So, you know, we, we know the value of email now. Uh, it's still the it's still the digital channel that delivers the most ROI. There's still lots of work to finesse it to you know you rinse out every every uh, uh, dollar that you can out of it, and there's lots of missed opportunities. So uh, yeah, yeah. Although, it, it, the question. <laughs> see, see, that's what we did though. So you know, we we weren't just being busy building our own careers. We were building the industry as well because we were. Yeah doing all of that converting you know it was it was a brand new fledgling industry we had to oh, 100% all the rest of it so we were working hard doing that but i'm going to go well, i mean in some of the early early sales conversations we were saying we could tell you open this email people used to look at you like you were a wizard oh, yeah yeah <laughs> so, what's, what, that's amazing <laughs> i used to sell email on that one thing alone they go what because you know beforehand they were using you know like Outlook or something to, to actually send their emails yeah. and send them by, you know, a hundred people at a time. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, you don't know who opens it. I can tell you who yeah. opens it. And just like, yeah, remarkably, there's oh, still some people out there doing that, but you know, yeah. Stuff, the world has significantly changed. Yeah. So it's good we don't have to educate people about this is a good thing to do. No, actually now it's about educating about doing it properly and, you know, all of the data protection, uh, and privacy policies are coming. That's the big bit that's changed. It's like, and certainly, arguably in the US, you know, it's, it's definitely not, you know, up here in Canada, we've got the Castle Act, and Europe, we've got GDPR. That sort of stuff's coming in the US. So it's like, you know, get yourself in shape now uh, yeah. for this stuff's coming. And to be honest, if you do this, you get better results anyway. So it's like, so training people out of what uh, is leading on bad practice. Which honestly traces back to what we've been preaching for the last. 20 years right is that permission is key ask and and respond with what they want to see and all that stuff and and what we're seeing is finally legislation is driving that point home if you if people had listened to us 20 years ago they wouldn't freak out about castle or about gdpr right yeah, yeah i mean there's, there's all the conversations i mean people who, who don't know us that well the likes of yourself ryan you know dennis you know, Dan, we've, you know you and everyone in the uk you know we used to sit there as, as accounts, that's why, you know, even though we were competitors, maybe in some points, it's like going, well, if we don't demonstrate the best practices and the way to do this in the right way, yeah. legislation will be forced upon us. Uh, and that decimates our industry. So we need to educate the industry. So when, you know, when, the, when the legislation comes in, it meets what we expect as, as the right criteria. And I think, you know, in Catherine, in the UK have gone through so many different best practice guides for various different things. And quite often they're over and above what the, the minimum legal requirements are in that, that territory. But you know, that's the right way to drag people in that, that direction. And if, if, yeah. if any people take advantage of that, that's when, you know, legislation comes in and really damages the industry because of a few bad actors. And you know, we, yeah. we weren't prepared to stand by and let that happen. I can remember when, when we were deciding, so Easy Mail was, you know, it was like one of the biggest uh, ESPs in Australia at the time. But what would happen there was that all the companies were owned by a parent company, which is residing either in the UK or in the US. So we would sell the local and they'd say, we've never seen anything like this. This is amazing. Where do we sign, right? Then they go and ask for budget. The parent company goes, what is this? And then they tell them what it is. Well, we want to see it. So then I do a demo. They go, this is amazing. We want it. But then they'd say, oh, but we don't want to deal with someone in Australia. You, you know, too far. We want to get a local person. So we would always, we, we converted them, but then we lost the deal because we weren't, so, you know, in the right time zone and everything. So that's why we decided to go over to either to the, to, to the US or to the UK. The thing that made the difference why we chose the UK and not the US was because um, uh, America didn't have any um, legislation, permission-based legislation mm. in place. And I just went, I don't want to deal with that. So we're going to go over to the UK where, where it's in place, yeah. you know, because it's a lot easier as an ESP, it's a lot easier to deal with. And also because I'm, I'm such an advocate for, for permission-based, you know, marketing. Well, I mean, there's a lot of money to be made where there isn't permission. I mean, even today's world, uh, yeah, Asia and you know, South America, it's a bit of a wild west in terms of data protection. But when you start doing that, I mean, it just gives you so many delivery and deliverability issues 
uh, yeah. the, the receiver end. So uh, yeah. <laughs> no interest in that. <laughs> so we're 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 out of time. We've got one last question, and it's a very very fitting last question. Fitting. And so, you know, the three of us have been drinking many many times. Um, mm -hmm. Tink, you and I probably had a bit of a head start because we lived in the UK, you know, um, for quite a few years together, whereas Ryan was over in the US. And I, I, can't, I can't even count how many times we've, we've been out drinking together, right? Um, and talking email, of course. And you would always, I mean, I'm there and I'm trying to leave, right? And you must have on record like over a hundred various ways ways of actually stating one for the road right you were you, you just you just came up with a different every time okay i'm there i'm about to leave and then you come up with a different expression and so i'd stay for another drink and then i'm about to leave and then you come up with a different expression again. Right. <laughs> i was like it's just, <laughs> sounds familiar <laughs> oh my goodness so uh, can you remember it or or, or or do you have to be you know sort of I'm struggling to remember because it's, I mean, I'm on, I'm on the other side of that chain these days. You know, having, having lived in, in New York, I'm very familiar with the Irish goodbye, which is just bolts before, don't tell anyone you're going because they're dragging right. back. And New York doesn't go to sleep. And when you're dealing with stuff in multiple time zones, you're going, oh, I've got a board meeting at like 6 a.m. or whatever, at 5 a.m., you know, I've, I'm going to make a run. So I'm kind of the other side of that. Now, but, uh, as you were talking, I'm trying to remember some of them, but there was definitely a there was definitely a cleansing ale. I remember oh, that. Oh, a cleansing ale, absolutely. <laughs> Let's have a cleanser. That was, uh, yeah. I think that lured you back. And I can't remember the others now. There, 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 oh, there, there, there definitely was two or three. And, uh, or more. The so Soho Hotel and uh, what have you around by the yes. HQ would be familiar. Yeah. Wrap my brains a bit, but yeah. Well, maybe I'm, I might have a cleanser after this, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you think of them, we'll, we'll put them on the we'll put them on the, the comments Your notes, yeah. under the YouTube one, just to give you know people food for thought for next time when they <laughs> want to keep people there. <laughs> I'm denying all knowledge, by the way, actually. Right. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. As as you know, Kath and I, when thinking about people we wanted to pull into this, you were at the top of the list just because. We've known you for so long and, and, and you're a good friend to all of us. So uh, thank you so much for not only your leadership, but friendship. And, and I don't know that going to the pub would be the same if, if Tink wasn't there uh, along with us. So uh, it's been a, ple it's a, it's a pleasure to come. It's been an honor to be invited. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, make sure to like the show, hit the up thing like that, right? Don't hit that because that's insulting. Hit that one. Uh, hit the subscribe, send us an email at us at uncorkedandunco.com if you have any questions for Tink or for us or God, Ryan, quit drinking so much or whatever, I don't know, but um, uh, send us an email if you want to be on the show or any comments. We'll be back next week with I don't know who because uh, I don't know which order we're going to put these in, but uh, whoever it is, they'll be a good friend of ours and, and we're going to have a good time. Uh, Tink, thank you very much. And as my uh, uh, partner, Kath, thank you. And uh, we'll see everybody next, uh, next time around. Be safe.